Hey friends, you're listening to season two of Draws in Spanish. If this is your first time listening, hi, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Fabiola Lara, that's Fabiola Lara. And on Draws in Spanish, I chat with Latinx visual artists and designers to discuss everything from their identity and culture to their creative process and work. Today on the show, we have So Lasso. So is an illustrator and tattoo artist from tiny tropical El Salvador, now based in Berlin. They are also the author of two illustrated books and have their own brand of illustrated products on Etsy since 2016. Of course, So also does a bunch of freelance work creating illustrations for clothing, pattern design, and of course, editorial illustration. I am so excited to have So on the show. So keep on listening to hear us talk about their experience moving to Berlin from El Salvador, their advice for finding your voice in your creative work, and their experience running an Etsy shop from El Salvador and moving it to Berlin. All right, so keep on listening to hear our conversation. Thanks so much for being here with me today. So I'm so excited to have you as one of the first guests for season two of Draws in Spanish. How are you doing? How are you feeling? What's going on? I'm good. I'm doing great. And thank you for having me and inviting me. I'm very excited. and just like a little bit nervous, maybe. <laughs> ah, it's okay. Don't worry about it. This is, you know, a friendly space. We're just going to talk about all about you, essentially. <laughs> okay, okay, so <laughs> to, to start things off, I like to ask people to do a little introduction so that people who don't know about your work and about you get a little bit more information. So Give us a little quick intro. Okay, so my name is Sol Lazo and I'm from El Salvador in Central America. It's a very, very tiny, tiny country, very tropical. And I am an illustrator. Well, officially I'm a graphic designer. That's what I studied. But ever since I graduated, I've been only dedicated to illustration, mostly, mostly for like my online shop, which is on Etsy. And I've had that for seven years now. So that's like, my main thing and then just occasionally do freelance work i also have like a couple of books that i published so far and oh and i'm also a tattoo artist yes <laughs> but that's like on the side so yeah <laughs> <laughs> on the side a lot you have a lot going on to have something <laughs> extra on the side but i love it i feel like you know that is what it is to be like a modern day artist you have like a lot of different things that you yeah. have to juggle all the time so one of the first things I want to talk to you about is you moved to Berlin. Like, I feel like I need to know more. What took you to Berlin? Tell me just a little bit more about why you went from El Salvador to Berlin, which is a, you know, a big distance and a yeah. big cultural <laughs> difference, too. Yeah, well, El Salvador is it's really a beautiful country, you know, like it's full of beaches and mountains and nature and the people are great. But uh, for an artist it's kind of very difficult to actually make a living of that living there because um, for me most of my clients and most of the people that you know buy my products they're actually from other countries it's more like an international thing and so it didn't I didn't have enough opportunities back home or like a space to grow or resources and all of that and ever since I was little, like my parents were always pushing me to tell me to go study someplace else or go and, and live in another country for a little bit because they had that experience when they were in college. And while well, I wasn't able to study outside, I studied in El Salvador, but I only I always had that, like, you know, I would like to live in another country and, and know how it is and meet a different culture. And I was lucky enough that I was able to travel to different countries, mostly in America, you know, United States, Mexico, Colombia, all of Central America. And then um, here to Europe, I came for the first time like three years ago. I was invited to tattoo in a studio in Paris. And so that was my first time here. And yeah, it was so exciting. That's um, so cool. How I dreamy. Was here around, <laughs> yes, I know. I It was super surprising for me <laughs> but uh I came for a month and, and a half 
something like that. And while I was here, I was like, you know, I gotta meet, I gotta get to know a couple of other countries since I'm already in Europe. And I went to Italy. And then I came here to Berlin because I have a friend that lives here. And ever like since the first day, I don't know, there was just something about the city that made me feel like this is where I want to live. Like I want to move here. And So two years ago, I made that decision and I finally moved here in September last year. So right now it's almost a year living in Berlin. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so inspiring. I feel like a lot of people have that feeling where you go somewhere and you're like, oh, this place is amazing. Imagine if I lived here. But yeah. very few people actually do it because emotionally it's a lot, financially it's a lot. It's just a lot in so many different ways. So I am like props to you for getting that done. And I know it has to be like hard. Um, I wanted to ask you, was there anything that like shocked or surprised you about culture in Berlin that is like very different from El Salvador? It definitely is like very different, but in a good way, because Honestly, the thing that I love the most is just being able to walk on the streets and like super and feel safe because uh, we have that issue back home that sometimes it's not so safe to just walk on the streets or use public transportation. That's another thing. Like I hate driving and in El Salvador, like you have to drive everywhere. Like everyone has a car, everyone has to drive. And so uh, I hate it. <laughs> so right now I just... Yeah, I walk around and I use a metro and, and everything's perfect. The Berlin has like a lot of issues like any other big city, but it's still way, way different than back home. And there's something else that I love. That it's like this feeling of freedom that you get here. Like everyone can dress however they want. They can be whoever they are. And, and it's not... It's not as dangerous or as unsafe that in other parts. And yeah, I just love that energy. And for example, um, it's very cliche, but I do love New York. Like I've been able to visit several times and, and I love it, but it's so chaotic. And, it and is, yeah. I think that Berlin is like a similar va version, but it's way, way more chill. It's like not as crazy, Ooh. but there's a still a really, really amazing art and people and, you know, a lot of places. So that's why I decided to come here. <laughs> yes, I feel like, yeah, New York is so tiring and the trains yeah. are horrible and the infrastructure is horrible. So I could definitely see how Berlin is way yeah. better in that regard. <laughs> I, I wanted to know, like, I know, and anyone who follows you on Instagram or on TikTok knows this, that you have an incredible fashion sense. Thank and you. even right here, if, if you're watching us on YouTube, <laughs> you can see Saul's outfit. It's incredible. I, I love the little, I don't know little what it's called, plant. little plants yeah. <laughs> coming out of your head. It is so, so cute. So do you think that, I know you've had this like fashion style since before you moved to Berlin, but has it been easier in Berlin? Have you been able to do more or anything like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I've been like experimenting with my fashion and my look since I was maybe 15 years old. But yeah, it was harder back home because people like stare a lot more and kind of more judgy about it. And yeah. here, like, no one really cares. Like, they really don't care. They don't stare. <laughs> like, maybe they just look for a second and then it's like, okay, they don't care. And I love yeah, that's, that. That's so liberating, right? Because yeah. you feel like you can do way more. Yeah, so... Even though I've only been here for a, a little bit, bit less than a year, um, I can see how my style has already changed a lot. Like, it's even more out there. <laughs> and and not only that, but I have, I have more access to, like, other types of brands and alternative fashion and all of that, which at first was a little bit of a problem because I was like, I want everything. <laughs> <laughs> So right now I, I, I learned to control myself because, yeah, it was, be, it was getting a bit too much. But, yeah, I do love that. It's, I have access to, to all types of things that I didn't have back home. Wow, that is so cool. I feel like you have, like, it's a whole new, like, world for you now in Berlin when it comes to at least fashion and everything. Do you think that it's, you know, going off of that a little bit? 
easier to be queer and non-binary in Berlin versus El Salvador? I don't know um, what specific town in El Salvador yeah. you're from, but... Uh, I'm from the capital city, which is San Salvador. And yeah, I we have the Pride March. It's uh, every June. And it's been amazing seeing how it grows each year. Like I started going maybe uh, around five or four years ago to the march and yeah like each year it was just getting bigger and bigger and that that made me really happy as well but there are still a lot of challenges you know that queer people face a lot of discrimination and even like uh, violence mostly when it comes to trans women and there's like a, a long way to go there but people are still fighting and here it's a bit of the opposite you know like um they had like three marches here I, I went to three of them there was like uh the dyke march and there was the pride march and then the trans march and it was in july so like a little bit a while ago and it was it was a party like back home it's more of a protest it's a march and here's like a celebration because they already have accomplished like a lot of things so it's mostly a party, but it's still a challenge, mostly for immigrants, I think, especially like people of color. Yeah, that's still kind of kind of a problem because like we can still face more discrimination because of it. Definitely. Definitely. I feel like, you know, how beautiful that you can celebrate um, celebrate in Berlin, right? Your identity and being queer and really just like enjoy it. But it's still so sad that in El Salvador you can't or you can but it's still like you said a fight right versus yeah. a celebration you're like you know you can't be as comfortable maybe um but i'm glad that you're experiencing i guess the berlin version for a while and i wanted to talk more about this that you mentioned about discrimination um towards immigrants and even queer immigrants um how do you think how has your experience been in berlin as an immigrant because i think it's so different anywhere you go right like yeah. I was an immigrant in the U.S. and it's but I'm so light-skinned that it's like I have a totally different experience than maybe you have you just you know a, sh a couple shades darker than me and maybe that's harder yeah. for you in Berlin um, I'm so curious just to know what it's been like for you well personally I haven't had like any bad experiences uh, at least that I that I think that it's because of of my my skin color because of being an immigrant. I've only had like maybe a couple of situations where they maybe look at me bad or something, but it's mostly because there are places where people just don't speak English. So they kind of get annoyed because of that. But it, I don't know. I don't really know if, if it could have to do with, with my nationality as well. It could or not, but I, so nothing like that has happened to me, but I have heard of other people, you know, like, for example, yeah, trans people mostly that have had several experiences in the streets where people maybe yell at them things or, or try to do something. But like personally, I, I haven't experienced that here. Well, I'm glad. I hope you never experience yeah. it. <laughs> I really do. And I think like you also as an immigrant, you never know, you know, if yeah. it's because you're because of language or because of the way you look or because of your gender identity or because of your sexuality. Like you just don't know um, why you're being disc discriminated. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, so you're like, is it that or is yeah. it you just don't like me? Like uh, what's going on? Um, is it my earrings? Like who yeah, knows? Like, but is it how I dress? Or <laughs> Is it how I dress or is it me as a human? Like, who knows? Yeah. But I hope that, you know, it's you never experience anything like that. And I, I think, you know, would you say overall that you appreciate having moved to Berlin despite any of the challenges that it comes with? Yeah, I mean, I, it's just so different and it's kind of sad in the sense that I realize that the quality of life in El Salvador for most people it's really not not good. Like we don't have access to all this freedom, to all these public spaces. Like I love this city because it's also very green and there are parks everywhere where you can just go and chill. And even that, it's like, I didn't really have that back home. Like for example, in the city mostly, 
and you had to go outside the city, which is like an hour drive to maybe the beach or something. But even in the beaches, it's like everything is uh, privatized. So, so it, yeah, it's like you have to spend money. Right. It's all about money, essentially, mm -hmm. like who can get to enjoy what that's sad and I hope that anyone in El Salvador listening is inspired by your story and maybe can uh, be encouraged to leave if they can if they want to you know because um, I know that for a lot of people they want to but maybe yeah. you know they don't have the means to leave and that's a whole other story um, so You guys, if you don't know, at the end of season one, I won $2,500 from Podcash. So this episode is actually brought to you by Podcash as a collaboration between Racket and Stir. Honestly, this was a really big deal for me as an indie podcaster because it validated the mission of the show and the money obviously helps since I pour my heart, energy, and time into the show. I just wanted to thank Podcash for awarding me this prize. And if you've never heard of Podcash, Podcash is exactly what it sounds like. Free cash for your podcast. They gave away $100,000 to up and coming podcasters as a way to support insanely creative and inspiring podcasters because they know how hard it is to get an indie podcast off the ground. So if podcasting has been on your to-do list or you're already a podcaster looking for a little funding, Go to podcast.com to stay up to date with future podcast happenings. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-H dot com. All right, let's get back into the show, you guys. Were you able to leave just through, did you go to school or anything like that? Or were you able to just do it on your own? I'm just asking for anyone listening who's like, yeah. oh, how did you do it? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the fact that I had that idea of moving since I was little uh, and my parents always taught me like to save money. They always did that. So I learned at a very young age that I should do that. So ever since I started working and I started with my brand and my shop when I was in college and doing freelance projects. And yeah, ever since I started, I always saved, saved, saved my money. But also I was lucky that my parents paid for my education. So, you know, I didn't have to worry about that. And I, I, I worked because I wanted to, not because I, I had to like pay anything. Like they pay my education and the house and food and everything. That was the reason why I was able to, to save money as well. And I know a lot of people don't really have that luck. And it's, it's a privilege to be able to do that. But I, I always tell my friends because a lot of people want to move out from El Salvador, which is, it's very sad, but it's the reality. And yeah. so I always encourage them, you know, try to save money, at least like a small percentage of what you get each month. Like it's, you can do it, like you really can, but you have to put that effort and it takes time. And that's what's most frustrating, I think, for a lot of people that it, it takes time and it's not something that happens like from one month to another or even a year to another. So definitely. Yeah, that. it's a long it's a long game. You have to really commit for a long time. Um Do you think now that you've been in Berlin for almost a year that you feel adjusted to Berlin or do you still feel like weird about just being <laughs> there and not being in El Salvador? And, and how is that feeling for you? It's weird because, um, of course, I miss my friends and I miss my family like a lot, a lot. But that's the only thing that I miss right now. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it's great I'm so glad that's amazing <laughs> yeah I, I, I I'm not fully adjusted yet uh, I came here without knowing any German at all so I I got into German classes and I've been going for like f four months but it really does make a difference you know like I feel a little bit more confident because the first time that I went to a supermarket I mean that was just I didn't understand anything like I didn't know if that was soap or if that was shampoo or, or any of that it, it was very weird I love that I love that no I mean I I feel sorry for you but I also <laughs> feel okay. like that is is like such a special experience to go from El Sal you know you lived in El Salvador yeah only before that right yeah my whole life was in El Salvador. so then to get put into a whole different country and culture It is such a weird experience and but also so fun because everything is random. Everything feels different every single day. 
And now that you've taken the German classes, I'm sure, like you said, you're more confident. But like how beautiful to experience being so like childlike, like being so new and having, (laughs) you know, that is a cool thing to be able to experience in adulthood. Just being like, I don't know what anyone is talking about. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Nothing. (laughs) I wanted to go back and talk a little bit about your family and your upbringing, because I know you mentioned that um, your parents were able to, you know, pay for your college and everything that comes along with it. I read somewhere, I can't tell you where, because I don't even remember, yeah. I was Googling so much, that your parents are both doctors, is that correct? Yeah, yeah they're both doctors. So. so that is like a very traditional profession, right? Like, you go to school, you become a doctor, you're a doctor forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, do you think that there, how was it to want to be an artist or did you always want to be an artist? Like what kind of trouble did you have figuring out your career given that your parents had such a traditional career? Well, I always liked drawing, but I guess like every child <laughs> likes drawing when, when we're all young. And, and, but I kept doing it, like, when I was in high school, and I was always doodling in classes and everything, but I never really considered uh, being an artist or an illustrator until when, until when I was in college, actually, because I started studying uh, product design in El Salvador, and, because, actually, I wanted to be a fashion designer back then, but we didn't have that career, so I was kind of like the closest because there was a year where, where you like saw all of everything about fashion design. So I, I was like, okay, I'm going to study this. And okay, so you got, as, you got as close to it as you could. Yeah. Right, within, <laughs> okay, perfect. Smart. Yeah, and then um, when I told them that, they were, they were pretty okay with it. You know, they, they have always been very supportive and they well my dad made jokes like okay you know well I guess you're just gonna live with us forever (laughs) you're gonna take care of us and I was like okay (laughs) that's a typical typical dad right yeah but yeah they always supported me and I I started with product design and the first year of college is where I realized what illustration was because I had never really heard that word or knew what it was but the in the first year, we shared a lot of classes with graphic design, and that's where I realized, and I was like, oh, you know, this sounds really cool, but still, I did two and a half years of product design. <laughs> Why? Why do you think you did that? <laughs> because I liked it, but I didn't thought that I had, like, the talent for it or that I would be capable to become an illustrator. Mm. Okay, I see what you're saying. So it was a little bit of like self doubt, right? Yeah. And I mean, I was doing okay in product design. But then I just, I I really didn't like the classes that I started having. So I was like, Oh, no, I don't want to do this anymore. And then I decided to change to graphic design. And again, my parents were were very supportive of it. Um, And I changed and Ever since I started going to graphic design classes, I just started drawing a lot, like for every project, even if it wasn't an illustration class, I, I was always putting illustration in everything, in branding, in web, in animation, like all of it. And I started also posting like on social media, on Instagram mostly. And yeah, I just, I started kind of getting followers. Somehow I wasn't expecting that. And people started asking me, like, if they could buy a print of my art. And that's the first time where I actually thought, like, I could maybe have my own brand. You know, I could maybe make money with this. And so I started my own brand while I was in fourth year of of graphic design in El Salvador. So there's five years. So I started in fourth year. Uh, I started selling in these little markets, you know, like random markets where everyone yeah, has a, like a local random, markets. Yeah, yeah, like someone selling soaps or someone selling food, and I was there with my illustrations and all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so little by little, you know, I started doing that, and then people from other countries were asking me, and like if they could buy my products and that was when I decided that I would open an Etsy shop and it just kind of happened like naturally like all the growth 
like all of this, I always say that it was maybe destiny or chance because I, I didn't plan any of that. <laughs> like I have not planned my career at all. <laughs> but I do believe it all that, just yeah. You always just took the next step, right? And yeah. Now look where you are. Yeah, so that I really do believe that when you find something that you really love and enjoy doing and you have the opportunity to keep practicing and keep doing it, like opportunity just come to you. Like they will. Because people will see like the passion that you have. And yeah, well, you got to show it too so people can see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to be putting yourself out there. I think that's a yeah. really like hard part of being an artist is like not only do you have to like make stuff all the time, but you also have to show it to people, which is a whole other part of the process so that people know what you're doing. And I think a lot of the times people do one or the other you know like they're showing up on the internet but they're not showing their art or they're making art but never showing it on the internet yeah and, you know it's hard it's tough do you have mm-hmm. how did you start I know you said like you started your Instagram and it kind of took off how did you kind of get the courage or did you even think about like sharing your art how was that process for you Well, I think it it had to do with the fact that I am not like an extrovert person. Like I know I look a certain way, but like my personality is not loud (laughs) at all. (laughs) That is surprising. Yeah, Yeah, it's just my my aesthetic is loud, but not my personality. (laughs) That's so so funny. My my aesthetic is loud. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) And um, so I always had like a lot of trouble with expressing emotions or feelings and that's basically why I started drawing it was like a sort of a art therapy for me like to get all these feelings out mostly negative feelings like sadness and anger and all of that so when I started posting it was it was you know these doodles with uh phrases or or thing, things that I was thinking back then and I guess that made it more relatable because people saw those things and they could be like, oh, you know, that's how I feel too. And and that helped kind of into making a community on social media. So, yeah, it, it was just, I've always called myself an, an emo person, <laughs> like very emotional. <laughs> I yeah. have, I, it's, yes, I agree with you. And I love that. I actually, I if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see I was like gasping because I wanted to ask you more about your emo-ness. Um, and I know you're referring to it in, in the sense of like sharing your artwork and being vulnerable. So, but what I'm talking about, if we can take a little segue, we'll come back to yeah. this topic about emotional <laughs> art. But I want to take a second to acknowledge your emo phase um, and maybe it's still your emo phase. And I want to talk about it because I know you like allude to it a lot when you post your like fashion outfits and TikToks and stuff like that. So tell me, I want to know everything about your emo (laughs) phase because I feel like I had one. I feel like a lot of people had one. It never ends, but it also kind of ends. So what were your favorite bands? What were your favorite like styles that you were doing? Tell me everything. I want to know. (laughs) Yeah, so in El Salvador, we also had that that phase, you know, that emo phase. I guess I was maybe around um, maybe 15, 16 years old when, yeah, everyone wanted to be emo. And I couldn't really... Yes. <laughs> I couldn't really, like, fully get into it back then because I didn't have, like, resources or, like, options or shops where to get all of the cool stuff. <laughs> so... I think right now I'm basically dressing how 15-year-old me would have wanted. <laughs> oh, I, I love that. I feel like that's the full evolution, right? Yeah. Like back then you couldn't. Now you can. Now you're in Berlin where it's even more accepted and like comfortable. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, I did want to shout out. Um, you have one post here. I'm going to pull it up. From April 28th, 2020. And then you're like nervous. You don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> no, it's the KK Slider album cover of oh, the Panic at yeah. the Disco, A Fever You Can't Sweat Out. Beautiful. I feel like that album was quintessential for, you know, budding emo and scene kids. I feel like, you know, there, it's controversial because there's like real emos and then 
oh, yeah. seen kids <laughs> and it's a whole dilemma. But I just tell, did you, apparently you love this album. Have you listened yes. to it lately? I, <laughs> I never, <wanna> I <laughs> never grew, grew out of my face, honestly. I, I don't even know yeah. what new music is. I'm just listening to the same thing that I listened when I was a teenager. Like, I, Tell me, give me, give me three. I want to yeah, know because I, mean, I, I feel like we're probably listening to the same things because yeah, I do the same boy, thing all the My time. Chemical Romance, Panic at the Disco, like those are the top three and I've been listening to them lately as well here. Yes. Yeah, so. That's the that's the band um. Were you on Tumblr when they were very popular? Yeah, I was on Tumblr in that time as oh, well. Oh, yes. Yes. That was like the trinity. Like everyone, those three were like ruling everything. I feel like Panic at the Disco that was one that I was like a little bit ashamed of telling people that I liked really um, because they were because it was like so exact like fallout boy I feel like was respectable mm. my chemical romance was like a little bit gothy but yeah. like respected and panic at the disco was doing like circus I love that yeah <laughs> and like and and that's like not respected <laughs> yeah, but, but I feel like you love that that's perfectly you like clown yeah, like very circus. carnival and all of that. Yes, so yeah. carnival. Yeah, that's but my now, favorite album of them. You know, that the first one. The second one was good too, but the first one is my favorite. <laughs> I agree with you so much. So anyway, but I feel like now you are bringing all your emo influences from when you were a kid to your fashion now. Do you think this also influences your work? I mean... I know you already said that your work is very vulnerable, but like, do you think aesthetically that it influences your work? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of my inspiration comes from the music that I that I hear. So a lot of that is from that. I even made like specific uh, illustrations based on certain lyrics of, of them. So it, it does. And also, I've always liked this mix of making really fun and silly and cute art, but mixing it with something a bit more dark maybe like um sad or anger like bad emotions or a bit of um things that I, that i've liked as a kid and emo bands have that aesthetic you know they they are a bit dark like the hearts and sometimes like the blood it was very very out there <laughs> and schools yes, of I, course the schools <laughs> that's like exactly <laughs> exactly i love it uh you don't know how excited i am and i want to talk to you about this forever but i feel like there's gonna be people yeah. who are like what is what are you guys talking about? yeah they, they, that, I that, that feel... don't like emo bands so yeah that's horrible to not like emo bands that's so sad um but i just have to agree with you so much like they definitely mix like I mean, I feel like maybe we're giving them a little too much credit. Like some of the lyrics were pretty bad back then. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Some did not so age said, well. No. <laughs> no, no, it's a lot of misogyny happening. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they did pair like emotion with like, you know, something a little bit more like aggressive or whatever, which and you're pairing, you're saying vulnerable and deep feelings with something like cutesy and uh, playful, but it's still like deep. Yes. I love it. I love it. And, you know, I, I was uh, reading a ton about you. I'm going to say this a million times, but I know that you like you have on your website. You like to explore themes of feminism, resistance, gender identity, sexual orientation and combining that with themes of magic and cute characters. So why do you think that's important for you to do? Like, what compels you to want to do that? I think it's just basically a mix from things that I've always liked as a child. Uh, one of my favorite things was reading books. And my, like, my most special books were the Goosebumps ones. Like, yes. I, yeah. <laughs> amazing so i've always been into that so i like scary things and as i started growing up and then i became a teenager and you know all of the witchy stuff i started getting into it like more and then i guess it also had to do with my uh, religious background and that i was in a catholic school and i started getting into the whole um, mythology and demonology like getting into as well Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. 
Okay, so be- my mind is blown, but so <laughs> I mean, I'm it's. It's to be expected, right? Like Central America, Latin America is very religious. So it's not that surprising. But I love that you're saying that that kind of drove you to the opposite. Yeah. (laughs) You're like rejecting it. (laughs) Yeah. It made me question my things, you know, like why, why is everyone believing this or why does everyone does this? And I guess I started exploring these uh, themes and making them more lighter or more fun, just as a way of saying, you know, like, have to take this seriously or or like the, this idea of the devil you know ma- making the devil a character that's actually nice or fun and it's like you know, <laughs> it's just uh, a character that's it so it's more approachable <laughs> what did your I'm just curious like what did your family think of that because I feel like that's where you know it gets a little tricky yeah uh, so yeah, my mom is very religious. My dad is Catholic as well, but you know, it's, he's, he's just Catholic, but my mom goes to church like every Sunday and all of that. And so she was just like, oh, why do you like drawing like uh, these demons or these witches? So I, was just, you know, like, I just like it. <laughs> like, why? But that was it. Like, she didn't like tell me, no, you can't draw that. Or it was, she was just like, hmm, that's just a little bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't Not my trying favorite to, thing <laughs> right she's like mm, maybe I won't buy this one um but <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I love that I think it's like very common that like when you get kind of pushed religion onto you whether it's Christianity Catholicism whatever religion gets pushed onto you naturally you're like I need space I need I need to like ask questions and I think it's beautiful that you were able to do that through your artwork um, because a lot of people don't have the courage to maybe do that or maybe they're not in a safe place to do that right like your parents were okay with it you know yeah it wasn't their favorite but it was fine um other people maybe they have you know their entire entire family is like maybe going to church every sunday then it gets really hard do you have any advice for people who don't know like what to say with their artwork because i feel like for you it's very clear like your voice in your art aside from just the aesthetic it's like super clear that you're trying to speak about these like really important topics like we said feminism gender identity sexual orientation all of that um but there are people who don't know what to say or they're scared to say it do you have any advice for like getting over that well for the part of like not knowing what to say i guess that's that has a lot to do with like self-exploration like knowing who you are and it, it sounds easy, but I think that a lot of people, including myself, have struggled with that. Like, who yeah. Like who are you? It's like, what defines me? What do I like? And so you have to first um, do that part, like actually get to know yourself and know what makes you happy and know um, your emotions in general. So it, it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of time, but you can do that as an exercise i think if especially if you like drawing you just start drawing the things that that you like or that make you happy or that you feel that you have inside so i think that's how you start with that um i guess it's always good to write you know like writing if it's a diary or or just random thoughts that you have that also helps a lot and and for well it's more difficult when you may you may know what you want to express, but like you said, you you have maybe people around you or or a context where you can't express it freely. Yeah. Um, in that case, I guess. Well, you could also use social media in a kind of an anonymous way, you know, <laughs> as a form of liberation at least, and not having like consequences in real life from people that might not agree with you or or that really don't like what you're saying so that's a way that you can do it you just have to let it out but like that's the first thing like let it out yeah I feel like yeah phase one is like looking inward like you said journaling exploring what compels you to make art and what you're what you want to say with your work step two is putting it out there but if you can't 
doing it anonymously is a really good um, recommendation. Like, um, I think Tumblr was a good one, right? It was like pretty anonymous. <laughs> um, you could be anyone there. And Instagram and TikTok makes it harder to be anonymous. But there yeah. are ways that you can like navigate it and keep it a little bit uh, like obscure. Um, so yeah, and then you can get a feel for if you like doing that, if you then eventually want to show your face when you're at a better place or whatever. Yeah. So those are those are really good tips. Um, so so thank you. So so thank you. I think uh, a lot of people fail to see that once you're a freelance artist and with a shop like yours, uh, it really is like a lot more work than just drawing the design. Yeah. Like there's so much really more. Like, <laughs> so I want to know like. What has been the challenges for you, the perks of having an Etsy store? You've had it now, like you said, for seven years. Yeah, um, well, it's been quite a journey. Like I started with very small and simple things, you know, like prints and stickers and, and buttons. And um, but I've always been into fashion like that never went away. So I wanted to put my illustrations in clothes as well. And that's where it started to get a little bit more trickier. Yes. <laughs> and, and a more complicated process because in El Salvador, I basically had to do every step of the process. For example, when I was making clothes or any other type of fabric product, I first had to go and buy the fabric and make sure it was a good fabric, depending on the type of product and the type of clothing. And then I would have to go to a, a printing studio where they printed the fabric. And then after I would have to go to, a, I work with a, a tailor, has like a little tailor shop and he had like a little team uh, with seamstresses as well. And he was the one that was in charge of, of actually, you know, sewing the clothes or tote bags or whatever, all of that. And first they had to make like a little sample to make sure that it was okay. And then, you know, make the, the rest of the clothes and then of course try it on and make sure that it works. And wow. <laughs> so much more, that's like more involved than I even thought because I mean, on one hand, that's super cool that it's so like local and, you know, you're involved with every step of the process. So you can like, triple check yeah. everything you know you're like i want it like this or i want it like that but that mean how long were were these products taking because it sounds like it could take a really long time before we keep on going with this amazing conversation i just wanted to interrupt to let you know about something totally new that i'm doing with this season of draws in spanish this season, I decided to launch a Patreon. In case you don't know what Patreon is, Patreon is a way you can support creators and gain access to exclusive content. So on the new Draws in Spanish Patreon, you can access exclusive rewards like joining our Discord community, listening to extended episodes, getting monthly prints and stickers mailed right to you, and even joining monthly drawing dates with me. If you want to be a part of all of that and so much more, become a patron of Draws in Spanish by heading to patreon.com slash draws in Spanish. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash draws in Spanish. Of course, I'll leave it linked below. So check it out. Yeah, I mean, um, it could take to make maybe around three, four weeks. Oh, no, no, a little bit more, depending on the quantity of the clothes. And oh, for that as well, I had to like uh, figure out the sizings, you know, so I had to yeah. kind of research about that as well and make sure that it fitted like different sizes. And yeah, after that, you have to take the photos of the products and, you know, plan the photo shoot. And then when it goes to Etsy and you have to prepare the listings and write the descriptions and put the prices and all of that. And then you and have then to post on social media. <laughs> yeah, you have to prepare your posts. Oh my <laughs> or gosh. Instagram how... or, or whatever. And then you have to actually ship it. And yeah, which is, that was which is harder than it seems, I think. Yeah. Um because shipping seems easy because everyone is used to like Amazon, but it's very involved to fulfill orders. If it's only one person, yeah, it really is a lot. 
Um, I used to take sometimes like one day in the week to like pack everything. And then usually on Friday, I would go to the post office and send everything. And sometimes I went like with this huge sack you know, full of orders and everyone already knew me in the post office by the <laughs> They were really nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what that takes a lot of commitment because now you can just, you know, use a third party and have your design printed and they fulfill yeah. it. And that's so much easier um, when you are just starting out. Um, and I, I bet you wish you had something like that back then um, or, you know, you took that route because it's but again, it's limiting. Right. So like the way you went, yeah. you can explore anything you can. You are working right. You know who's making your clothing. That's like a big deal. Yeah. Um, but it takes so much effort. Right. Because you're. It is, yes. It's so much more work. So, you know, are you still doing that today? What's it look like now? Well, I, well, I guess I started the opposite way. Like I started doing everything like very yeah. hard and complicated, but uh, I changed now because with the, when coronavirus started and the mm -hmm. pandemic, um, basically the whole country shut down. And so the, the post office that it was closed, no one could send anything. So oh that changed gosh. everything because that was how I was making a living. <laughs> Are you for real? The post office? Yes, it did. Like for months, it was closed. In El Salvador, and right? So, yes, in El Salvador. Oh, and, wow. and I was lucky, like my partner back then, he like knew a lot of stuff because he was also a designer. And he was like, you know, there's this this thing that you can do that's called drop shipping, And... Yeah, and I was like, "What's that?" <laughs> You're like, "Tell me more." <laughs> yeah, I had no idea, and that's when I realized and and that I could just focus on the design, which is my favorite part and it's the most fun part. And out of need, I started doing that. You know, um, working with a production partner where they print and make the products and they ship it themselves it's so easy and it was like a whole new world for me oh my gosh yeah I think you know sometimes drop shipping gets a little bit of criticism and, and I get it but I also think like for small artists for independent makers it makes so much sense because yeah. you know like what you were doing before having to figure out the sizing having to figure out even like um, inventory, like how many of all of this do you need yes. um, is a really big commitment when you're just starting out. And even I think for a long time, while you're still independent, it's really hard to navigate that in a way that's actually making you any money <laughs> because you yeah. can invest so much and then, you know, it may not work for you or that design didn't work. So I just want to encourage anyone who's listening, who's like, I don't know about drop shipping. Um, check it out. It could be a really good avenue for you. So are you still using drop shipping? Uh, how are you handling uh, your orders today? Right now, yeah, I'm still using a production partner in drop shipping because uh, I'm still not that settled here yet. So and since I'm going to German classes and I'm trying to figure out the visa stuff and everything, I don't have the time that I need to focus again, like completely on my shop. But for example, next year, I do hope to be able to make another types of products because yeah, that's one thing you, you can get bored if you keep doing the same thing for too long. And like, I already tried to do a bunch of, of the products that they offer, like almost the whole catalog. <laughs> so yeah, I want to experiment a bit more with the type of clothes that I want to make and with the type of products that I want to sell. And I started this year uh, with uh, my tarot deck, which is like my late, latest thing, uh, working yeah with a, with a company directly with myself and preparing the deck and designing it. And right now I'm actually making another um, couple of products that are more special that hopefully I will have them in a couple of months and yeah, which is different. So because it's not drop shipping anymore, I'm, I'm just like making yes. things that are more special and not so generic as with yes. drop shipping. Exactly. Like that is the big downfall of using like print on demand, which is also drop shipping. Um, you have to select what they offer and print on what they offer. So that's really yeah. limiting, especially 
because you used to do it in a very custom way. So now it has to be, you know, you have the perks that it's easier to fulfill and to create on the go. Um, but it's harder to get that unique stuff. And I feel like for you with such a unique fashion sense and you have like a, a very specific vision, it has to get old after a while to only be creating in like the specific product offering that they have. And I'm, I'm so glad that you brought up your rainbow tarot um, because I saw that it's sold out already. So if you're listening, you can't get it right now, but maybe there'll be, <laughs> there'll be a restock eventually. Yes. Um, but I wanted to know, yeah, like this is, I looked at it. I was, I was um, looking at all the pictures. It looks very custom, like the box, the cards, the packaging. So can you tell me like, how long did it take for you to, create that kind of product just so people understand the difference between a custom product like your tarot deck yeah. and you know a tote bag or a shirt from print on demand well the first part which was the designing like actually illustrating every card well that took years yes <laughs> i bet around. that's so how many yeah. cards is it i'm not that uh there are 77 cards Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> They're my, all different. Yeah. My eyes just like go blank. That's so many cards. Yeah, it took me about six years maybe to finish the whole deck because it was a personal project. It wasn't something urgent or that I needed to do it fast. It was something that I enjoyed doing. So I took my time and maybe did like one or two cards each month and that's how it started. I didn't even really thought that I would finish a whole deck. That just <laughs> kind of happened too. It's cool that you are sharing like, yeah, sometimes you use print on demand, but sometimes you do custom stuff. I think that's like a really cool model to have because that way, you know, you're investing in the specific pro projects that you, you know, want to do, but then the other things can be a little bit easier. So you have time yeah. to, you know, work on all the different projects that you want to do so this is this is the end of our beautiful conversation I do have more questions for you but I feel like this is <laughs> that I've asked you plenty you know we'll have to do a take two sometime um is there anything like where can people support your work um or where should they go follow you for the latest updates well mostly I'm on Instagram and TikTok and twitter and tumblr still i use tumblr <laughs> you do use tumblr i was looking at it do you <laughs> auto post or like do yeah, you it's go basically post? the same i go okay. post yeah wow I mean, whenever she's I post logged on in Instagram, <laughs> i i go post on tumblr but uh yeah instagram we know like lately it's been an issue for so many artists like the algorithm and all of that it's so weird but you know, I'm still using it and hopefully it will get better and they will fix that. Go check out So Everywhere, uh, <laughs> including including their Etsy shop. So go check it out. And once again, So, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for uh, your patience with all the technical hiccups. Um, <laughs> thank you. And thanks for, yeah, just like being here. I know that you're in Berlin, so there's a time difference. So I just really appreciate it. And I can't wait to see you grow everywhere. <laughs> No, thank you. It was really nice meeting you too. All right, everyone. That's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with illustrator, author, and tattoo artist, So Lasso. If you haven't already, please check out their TikTok, their Instagram. Just follow at Sonia Lasso underscore. Or just check the link in the show notes. There will be a link right to their social media handles. Now, before you go, I have to remind you to hit subscribe to Draws in Spanish if you like this episode. Subscribing is totally free and really helps me out and helps the show out so I can keep making it for you. If you want to connect with other Latinx artists in our Draws in Spanish community, please head over to our Patreon, my Patreon for Draws in Spanish, so you can join our Discord channel and access a ton of other amazing perks. That's all I have for you now. Hasta la próxima. Thank you for being here. Chao, amigos. <laughs>